you might have been in the situation where you have to get to a spot as soon as possible and there's two routes, which route do you take? We first need to talk about reference frames or frames of reference. A reference frame is just a way to look at things. A reference frame is a desired coordinate system, meaning you get to select which way is positive and which way is negative. I can have going to the right of my coordinate system being positive. I can also make it negative. It's all up to you. It's your desired coordinate system. It's your reference frame. Reference frames are important because there are some quantities that rely on a certain position and a certain direction. Reference frames allow us to talk about two types of quantities. A scalar and a vector. A scalar is a quantity that only has a magnitude. You can think of a magnitude as an amount or size. So for instance, if you have 16 potatoes, the magnitude of potatoes you have is 16. We deal with scalars all the time. We just don't call them scalars. You should be familiar with quantities like time, length, mass. These are all scalars. They only have an amount. These quantities don't depend on direction. It doesn't matter which way you're facing or which way you're heading. It just cares about the amount. One scalar we're gonna look at is distance. Distance. We should all be familiar with distance. Distance is just how far did you travel in total. This is a meter stick. One whole stick is a meter. We're gonna be measuring distance using meters. That's gonna be the SI unit for distance, meters. Remember how distance is a scalar? Well, that means direction doesn't matter. For instance, if I went from point A to point B, my total distance would be five meters. But if I instead went from point A to point B back to point A, my total distance is 10 meters. It doesn't matter that I had to go backwards to get back to A because distance is a scalar. But there are times where it's important to talk about direction, where direction does matter. That brings us to a vector. So a vector is like a scalar. It has a magnitude, but it also has a direction. That brings us to displacement. Displacement is just how much you change your original position. When something's been displaced, it's been removed from its original spot. Since vectors deal with direction, sometimes vectors can be negative. But generally, scalars are never negative. Generally, there's a couple of funky things out there. Let's look at the case again where we're at point A, going to point B, and it's five meters away. I'm gonna take going to the right as positive. This is my reference frame. In the case where you're starting at point A and going to point B, both distance and displacement are the same. This isn't true for every case. In this scenario, distance and displacement are the same, but this doesn't happen all the time. Let's suppose we go from point A to point B back to point A. What's our distance and displacement now? Notice how in this case, distance and displacement are not the same thing. When you move backwards, that affected displacement. It didn't affect distance. When you went backwards, you were closing your displacement. You were moving back to your original spot. So you didn't have any displacement. You weren't moved from your original spot, but you had a distance because you moved. Distance is a scalar, does not care about direction. Displacement is a vector, it cares about direction. Oh, I almost forgot. The SI unit for displacement is also meters. But once again, distance and displacement are not the same thing. You have to know the difference. Distance is a scalar, displacement is a vector. The thing about vectors is you gotta worry about all the directions you're moving in. Sometimes in our problems, you might not be moving just in a straight line back and forth. You might be moving in two dimensions, up and down, left and right. So for an example, if you move four meters north and then six meters east, you're not 10 meters away from your original spot. You're four meters north from your original spot and you're six meters east from your original spot. Your distance might be 10 meters, and in fact, you did move 10 meters, but your displacement isn't 10 meters. The distance doesn't care that you went north and then east. That doesn't affect it. You just go four plus six. But with displacement, you're not 10 meters from your original spot. 
You gotta use the Pythagorean theorem in order to figure out your displacement. But don't worry, we will get there soon enough. This is a quick preview of what's to come. In our problem, we have to get to our destination in the quickest way possible. Which means we need to worry about time. Time! In this class, we're going to define time as the number of seconds between two events. Now, I know what you're thinking. That's a really crappy definition of time. And you know what? You're right. It sucks. Time is really funky, and we generally don't know what time is. We're still discovering that. But for this class, we're going to call it the number of seconds between two events. Oh, and one more reminder. Time is a scalar. So there's no direction. You can't go 30 seconds north. That doesn't make any sense. Let me ask you a question. Who moves quicker? Person A, who's moving 25 meters in five seconds, or person B, someone who's moving 750 meters in 150 seconds? How do you know? It turns out that both of these people are traveling the same amount of distance in the same amount of time. This rate of distance per time is known as speed. So speed is just the rate of how much distance do you cover in a certain amount of time. If we take each person's distance and divide it by how long they were traveling for, we see that both people were traveling at a rate of five meters per second. Don't get confused about what a rate is. A rate is just connecting two quantities together. So we connected distance and time together. We can look at this and see that for every five meters you go, it takes them one second. That's what speed is. It's how fast you're moving. It's the rate of total distance traveled in a certain amount of time. From this quick scenario, we can already tell what the SI unit for speed is. The SI unit for speed is meters per second. It's distance per time. We already know that distance is meters, time is seconds, so it just makes sense that the SI unit is meters per second. Now, speed is a scalar, meaning direction does not matter. So in these problems, we only have moving five meters per second. We don't know if they're moving five meters per second north, five meters per second east, south, west, in, or out. But what if you wanted to talk about speed and direction? If you want to look at the vector form of speed, you now have velocity. So velocity is just speed and a certain direction you're moving in. So with speed, you might be moving five meters per second, but with velocity, you need to be moving five meters per second east or north. You need the direction. In science, we model a lot of things after math. So if we can explain it mathematically, then we know it actually happens in our real life. So now we're gonna put in the math part. The math part! To look at the math of motion, we need to put symbols to things. We're gonna call V speed, which has a unit of meters per second. We're gonna use the X for distance and we're gonna use T for time. If we remember that the definition for speed is distance over time, then our formula is V is equal to X over T. They're just variables, don't get confused. Okay, so that's speed, that's the scalar side. Let's talk about the vector side. All right, so remember how velocity is a vector? That means direction matters. And if direction matters, that means we have to look at the displacement. So when speed is distance over time, velocity is displacement over time. I know what you're thinking. When you look at this, this looks all very the same, even though you might be talking about two different things. Like how can V both be speed and velocity? And how can X both be distance and position? That doesn't make any sense. Like we talked before, there is a difference between scalars and vectors. And this difference is important. To distinguish the difference between a vector and a scalar, we use a hat. When I say a hat, I just mean a little arrow on top of the quantity you're talking about. So velocity is a vector, so to denote that it's a vector, we put a hat on it. We're going to use this symbol as our hat. This just tells us if it's a vector or not, so we don't get confused. So every time you have a vector, put a hat on it. It lets us know if we have a vector or a scalar. Because notice, the symbol for speed and velocity is V. It's the same thing. Speed, no hat. Velocity, hat. I just really want to make sure that you guys are understanding the difference because a lot of times the most common mistake people make is they mix up speed and velocity. 
Speed is a scalar. It's measured in meters per second, but direction does not matter. Velocity is a vector. Direction does matter, and it's also measured in meters per second. Speed is distance over time. Velocity is displacement over time. So one thing we've got to make sure is the difference between instantaneous speed and velocity and average speed and velocity. Instantaneous speed or velocity is just speed or velocity at that given time. To find average speed or velocity is actually we've already talked about and discussed the formula that we're going to use. We're going to define average speed as total distance over total time and average velocity is going to be total displacement over total time. I know that these definitions seem very familiar to the same definitions we used before, but that's because they are. We just have to remember that average is looking at your whole section, where instantaneous is looking at one point in time. I'm going to show you one more way that we can describe an object's motion. Using a graph. We're going to do a position versus time graph and an object moving. The reason why I put the zero marker in the middle of the graph, rather than at the bottom, which you might be used to, is because when you describe an object's position, it's possible that the person might be moving in the negative direction. If right is positive and the person moves to the negative direction, then they would be going a negative position. Just for simplicity, I'm going to make each box one unit. So on the x-axis, that will be one second for every box. And on the y-axis, it's plus or minus one meter. Notice, I've got zero in the middle, so going up I have one meter, two meter, three meter, four meter, and so forth. And then I'm also going to put my negatives below zero. So negative one, negative two, negative three, negative four, and so forth. All right, let's finally describe this object's motion. Let's just say that he's starting at zero. That makes the most logical sense. Now let's assume that this person's moving one meters per second in the positive direction. If he's moving at one meters per second in the positive direction, then that means after one second, he has gone one meter. Now, if the person continues to walk at one meters per second after two seconds, he should be at two meters. And then, of course, if we wait three seconds, he should be at three meters. You should hopefully be getting the idea that if you're walking one meters per second, then every second you go, you're going to be one meter further than your original position. And we can draw a nice pretty line to show, hey, this person's moving at a constant velocity. But in real life, not everyone moves at a constant speed. Sometimes you change your motion. And we can graph that as well. Let's say that after four seconds, our person gets tired and decides to take a rest for additional four seconds. Well, notice that if the person is standing still for four seconds, time is still increasing but his position is not increasing. He's still in the same spot. In fact, he's gonna stay four meters away until he begins to walk again. As he stands in the same spot for four seconds, we can see on the time graph that time keeps increasing, but his position stays the same. Let's say after this person rested for four seconds, they realized that they were heading in the wrong direction. In fact, they have to go two meters behind the original spot. Let's assume they're still traveling at one meters per second. Let's graph what their motion would look like. So originally they're four meters away, four meters in the positive direction away from their original starting spot. And let's say they walk one meters per second. Okay, so if they're walking one meters per second and they need to get to two meters behind the original spot, we can graph this motion to see how long that will take them. So starting at four meters and eight seconds, I'm gonna go one meters per second in the negative direction. That means on the ninth second, they should be three meters away from the original position. And then they will be two meters away from their original position. And then they will be one meter away from their original position. And then they will be at their original position. But we still have to go two more meters behind original position. So. Another second passes. We're almost there, we just gotta get one more meter in the negative direction, and now the person's at their destination. It's not a bad idea to draw a line of best fit, just so you can see an object's motion more clearly. 
So I can use this graph in many different ways to look at a person's motion. Notice that we've been doing a position versus time graph. If we decided to do a distance versus time graph, then we wouldn't have any negative motion. There is no negative motion with distance. So if we wanted to translate this position versus time graph into a distance versus time graph, we would just have to take this negative displacement and turn it into positive distance.